All right, thanks, Dean. Uh, thanks, everyone. This is my, my first uh, software conference ever, so I'm a little bit impressed. Or, uh, well, I'm going to talk about the project I've been working on for about a year now. Uh, it's called Pihul, from the name of the Spanish bird. Uh, it's, it's, we're trying to do sane version control, and by sane, like I'm going to, like, do, this talk is mostly about what sane means and what version control should be like. So it all started because I was trying to, uh, so Flo and Baker, my co-author on this project, myself, were trying to uh, convince our co-authors on an academic paper to use version control instead of just uh, emails and like, uh, like reserving files for a week in, uh, in a LaTeX file, right? So, so but well, uh, Flo happens to be one of the core Docs developers, which is a like, rather oldish uh, version control system. And so we couldn't really convince him to use anything else. Uh, so, so we tried to convince our co-authors to start installing Docs on Windows and then uh, like setting up SSH keys and uh, pushing, to, uh, pushing patches and pulling stuff. And it, that didn't really work out. So well, also it turns out uh, Docs has performance problems uh, and Git has simplicity problems. So well, it wasn't really easy to do anything about it. And that's pretty much the situation with version control today. Like most people, uh, most non-hackers don't even use it. So it's ri widely regarded as a uh, hacker's thing. And most people like use extremely basic version control, even like top like world experts in, uh, in computer science still use uh, like file locking and emails. And that makes us lose a significant am amount of data and or time. And even the situation with programmers, I'm sorry to say, uh, isn't much better because like as soon as distributed version controls were, inv were invented, uh, they're, like, they were so complicated and hard to use that there were, like, businesses even started to recentralize them and uh, use, the, use, the, use them in a centralized way in order to master the, the beast. Um, and in parallel to this, uh, functional programming is finally convincing people that they can really tackle everything, like all field of computer science that were, that were previously re regarded as like elite field, just like uh, Ashley s uh, showed us for operating systems. Uh, we're trying to replace C++ with Rust. Uh, recently also JavaScript is like starting, starting to get replaced by Elm. Uh, package managers and Linux distributions are getting replaced by like Nix. It's not widely accepted so far, but uh, and so this talk is about adding, adding another functional tool to that collection, and it's called uh, Pihul. Uh, we set out to replace uh, Git. Uh, probably this goal is as ambitious as for Rust to replace C++, or maybe more. But, uh, but anyway, so before starting this talk, I just wanted to, uh, to uh, like get, give some basic uh, concepts about what I, what I think functional programming is. So most people have their own definition. Feel free to agree or not with this. So I think f functional, so my, what I like in functional languages like Rust is that there are static types, so we don't, like, we, we can reason about code uh, easily. There's fine control over mutability. It's like we're not mutating some, uh, some states all the time. We're just uh, thinking about transforms and, and stuff and functions. Uh, most operations are atomic, which is what most people use when they use, like, any software at all. Uh, and it's something that's not really happening in most, most software and mo most tools. And we also like memory safety. We, we don't want like, to uh, just corrupt our backend or cor corrupt our storage, our files or something. We don't want to lose data just because we're uh, using, it, like, using types in the, in the wrong way. Uh, so how does that apply to, uh, how, how's that any beneficial to version control? Well, because the way we use version control today is mostly about states. We're talking about commits. Uh, like for instance, if we use gits, we're talking about commits. And commits are stateful. They're just basically a hash, like a, a patch to like, make it easier to, like, but it's just an optimization. It's just to make it easier to store. Uh, and, and a hash of the whole state, the repository. That's what a commit is. And when you commit something, you just advance uh, the, the head of the repository by, by one small notch. Uh, and you hash the whole state of the repository. That's the name of your new, new commit. Uh, and that's quite different from patches. So patches are all about transforms. They're all about, like, uh, bringing like any states, like applying, like when you apply a patch, you can basically apply a patch to a file, and it's like that's what most people think commits are when they first uh, first discover GIS, but, but then they realize it's not it's not really the case. Um, and so this can have major benefits, uh, like for instance, in 
like any system that uses uh, three-way merge, such as like Git, Mercurial, SVN, CVS, and like most others, um, they don't have that really cool property that we call associativity in algebra, and that property is the following. So if, if you have two, uh, two people, Alice and Bob, and they're not really good at communication, right? They're a couple. Uh, and, uh, well, Elise writes uh, uh, like the red patch here, and Bob in parallel writes that like first the blue patch and then the green, green patch. Uh, well, depending on the order in which you merge things, depending on what like your merge strategy, you might get different results in three-way merge. Like if the patch are exactly the same, and I like first I I try to uh, to merge the blue patch first and then the green patch, I might get in Git sometimes I might get different results uh, than if I do. Uh, the, the, other, the other thing, like on the, the image on the top, if I merge the, the, the two branches, I might get one result. And if I merge the two, the, like the exact same patches and they're not conflicting, they're not like, they're not weird, the situation, like they're editing diff really different parts of the file. Sometimes uh, Bob's patches might get merged in parts of the files he's never seen. And when you consider applying tools like that to uh, like highly sensitive codes, such as like cryptography libraries, it's kind of scary but it's like what everyone does. Uh, and so, so what's even worse is that you cannot, really, uh, you cannot really tell when this hits you. Like if you're a Git user and this happened to you, there's no way to, there's no way to tell. Git says, yep, yeah, I've merged, uh, it's fine, it works. And you don't, you don't notice it. Maybe, maybe it even compiles, like there are real world examples uh, of, this, of this thing. And it's not just an implementation bug that can be worked around, it's like a fundamental uh, problem in the three-way merge algorithm. All right, so well, we're not the first ones to, uh, to believe this is wrong. Uh, there, there was another uh, version called system I talked about in my intro slide, which was called Darks. It's still, still called Darks, by the way. Uh, <laughs> so the, the, so their, their, main, their main principle is that you say two patches are okay, of like fine with each other, they don't conflict, if they commute. So what that, that means is simply that you can apply them in the order. Well, in the New York, like, oh, they almost commute. It's not exactly, com like if for you, for the, like those of you who are uh, into algebra, it's not really uh, commuting because you, sometimes you may have to uh, change the like line numbers. Like for instance, if, if, if uh, Bob adds a line called, like, with just containing just fn main and it's line one, and Elise uh, add, adds a line that, like line 10 uh, saying print ln hello world, when you merge them, well, you might have to uh, merge Alice, Alice's line uh, after Bob's line at line 11 instead of 10, but that's, well, that's kind of commuting. Anyway, so that's, uh, that's the situation with darks. Uh, when it commutes, it's fine. What if it doesn't commute, which happens sometimes? Well, it's an undocumented part of the algorithm, uh, so no one really knows what it does. Uh, Florent, my co-author, um, Pihul, is one of the core darks developers, and he told me, like I was pretty confident in darks before, then he told me at some point, yeah, we have no, absolutely no clue what it does. It seems to work most of the time. It's like it highlights conflicts, but we don't really know other than that. Uh, so that raises obvious issues about uh, correctness. So the situation with darks is not much, much better than with Git. Uh, well, at least it highlights conflicts and warns the user about conflicts, but then what it does, no, no one knows. Uh, another problem that's slightly bigger, that's the main reason why darks was abandoned, even though it came before, uh, before Git, is that it's sometimes exponentially slow. So exponentially slow in the size of history, the number of patches in the repository. And so that's, uh, that has led some people to uh, devise the like, merge over the weekend workflow, where you uh, like, try to synchronize all the patches you made during the week. And instead of synchronizing uh, like, while you're working on it, you're just like, uh, waiting for Friday night to arrive, start to merge, like push your patches. And well, hopefully by Monday morning when you come back to office, uh, well, the patches are merged, but sometimes not. <laughs> so this is, this is, this makes it kind of like not really acceptable. And this is also one of the reasons why we could not convince our colleagues to, uh, to, to use it because they tried to use it. Naively thought, yeah, well, patches, well, we kind of understand what they are. So let's try to push a bunch of patches to re repository. And well, they were surprised to uh, have to wait for uh, like half an hour uh, before the patches were merged. So it's not usually like that. Like when we're, write, we're developing people, uh, we're using darks uh, to develop it. And it's like, we've never, we've never ever run into that, pro that problem, but that's also because we're like a 
we know how it works, we know what the draw drawbacks are, we know what, when the exponentially slow merges happen. So, but that's not acceptable. Like, it's, it's not, like I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. Um, and that's where uh, Pihul comes in. Uh, so we try to, so after our day trying to convince our colleagues to use this, we just like grabbed, grabbed a beer and started discussing about uh, like uh, the theory of patches, what, what, it, what it could be like, what, what, would, uh, what it would be like to have a cool patch algebra that we could use and that would be simple and easy to use. And that's uh, where we started lear learning about category theory. So we didn't exactly start learning, uh, lear learning back then, but it's, cause it's a kind of a, it's not, a, it's not the easiest theory on earth, uh, on earth but well, so what it, is, what it is basically, it's a general theory of transformations of things. So category theorists like to uh, see it as like the general theory of everything. They, they're, they are, there are numerous attempts to uh, rewrite all mathematics in a categorical language. And I think it's pretty successful, except that no one can understand it. So that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, well written, it's well written. We have all mathematics in there, but no one knows what it does. All right. Uh, so, but it's, it's pretty good for us though, because it's, um, so we're, we're trying to talk about changes and files, and this is a theory of changes of, on things. So one particularly cool concept, so this, you can, you see all like, I, I, I showed like this, these things in darks, uh, these are commutative diagrams, and category theorists try, like, are drawing them basically all day long. Uh, we have several colleagues working on it. They have their whiteboard full of these diagrams, sometimes in 3D, sometimes with like, we are interleaved arrows and no one knows what, what they're doing, but uh, they're, yeah, they're talking about transformations on things. All right, so in particular, one uh, very cool concept of category theory is the concept of pushouts. Uh, so pushout is a, so the pushout of two patches is like for, in our particular case, the pushout of two patches would be a file such that no matter what you do after these two patches that uh, yields a common state, like a common file. So if Elise and Bob write some stuff and then later they can find some patches to agree in a common file. Well, uh, the, the star here is, a, we call it a push out. If you can reach, the you can reach any common sta state in the future from that star. Is that clear? <laughs> All right. Uh, so anything you can do to uh, reach a common state, you can also reach it from the push out. So th that means the push out is kind of a minimal common state. Uh, that can be like that you that you really need to reach like and it's, it's really what what we want in a version control system we really want push outs we want minimal common states that any further developments any further uh, work in the repository uh, can also be reached from that common state so that, that's what a merge really is and it's it's uh, it's it's so the one, one, one problem is that it's not the case that all categories have push outs have all push outs like we see that, like the translation of that in English is, uh, it's not clear that any editing, any two of, any couple of editing operations on a file will always be mergeable. Like sometimes we have conflicts, we all know, like mo most programmers know, but uh, editing, co edi editing conflicts. So it's not the case that files have all push outs, files and patches have all push outs. But what's cool about category theory is that there's a solution. Uh, you just need to, uh, <laughs> to dig, dig into the, like, pretty big books of like abstract diagrams that I don't really understand. Uh, but then you can uh, ultimately find something called the free conservative cool completion of a category. And that's a way to uh, artificially add all push outs into the category. So that means when you, when you have a category of files and patches between files, the free conservative cool completion is a construction that will uh, automatically give you a category, like a generaliz generalization of files, uh, so that like that generalization will have all push outs. So in Pihul, if we translate it into uh, like files and patches, for instance, if Bob adds a line, uh, like saying just print a line, Bob, and Elise adds a line saying just print a line, Elise, when they merge that in Pihul, what they get is just a graph of lines uh, where uh, the two lines are added. They're not comparable because they've not yet said what, like, how they should compare and how they, they, they should relate to each other in the file. Maybe, maybe Alice is right, maybe Bob is right, maybe they're both right, maybe they're both right but in a different order. You don't really know, but that's a conflict. And so 
what that theory, what category theory gives you here as a generalization of files, it's, which is, well, in most cases, a little more, more complex. Like, it's more the, the benefits for a three lines file are maybe not obvious, but when files get really large, it's, it's really great to have that sound theory that backs you up and, right, so that's, uh, that's what Pirol is about. That's, that's how it works. Uh, so, I want, just wanted to say before moving on that uh, this is quite different from CRDTs. So CRDTs are conflict-free uh, replicated data types. And Pihul is more like conflict-tolerant replicated data types. So we're not resolving all the conflicts all the time. We're just, rather than that, we're just uh, like accepting conflicts as part of the system. Like the data structure can handle, like it, it, can, it, it can represent conflicts. It doesn't have to resolve them all the time. And so that's what makes it fast. Uh, that's what makes Pihul really fast because you can apply many patches. They are conflicting, but that's all right. And then once you're done applying a bunch of patches, uh, you're, you can just like detect conflicts and output the files and that's it. Uh, so what, what would the situation be with CRDTs if we were trying to uh, apply CRDTs to this problem of like uh, merging patches? Well, in CRDTs, you need to always order. So the way it gets rid of conflicts is by ordering all operations determin deterministically. So it finds whatever solution, like whatever deterministic merge algorithm they can find to uh, like just order, order things, order operations in an <coughs> arbitrary but deterministic order. Like for instance, they can have a rule saying, Elise, uh, Elise's patches always, com always come first. And when there are two conflicting uh, patches from Elise, uh, just take, like, uh, take them in uh, alphabetical order, for instance. Uh, and so in our, w in, in our case, that would like, uh, lead to the following file. Uh, like two lines, one saying print align Elise, one saying print align Bob, and the user would barely see anything. They would be like, yeah, that's, that's it. The merge has succeeded. But that doesn't, that, that isn't really right because that, like, the, the user should be, at least be warned that there's a conflict and they should do something about it. Um, all right, so the end result of that is, well, the theory is a slightly more complicated than what I've explained, but not much more. Uh, the result of that is that we uh, developed a sound theory of patches, a uh, sound algebra of patches, and it has the following very cool properties. Uh, so bear with me for a moment while I'm like saying these uh, uh, like, uh, bad words. So the, the theory is like the, our algebra is commutative. It means you can, like, if patches don't depend on each other, you can apply them in any order. Uh, so that's, that's what you would expect from patches, right? Uh, it's associative, so we resolved the initial, the initial problem I started this talk with. Uh, so you can, you can basically, like no matter how you merge patches, if the merge is right, like there's only one solution to merge, and you're not, yeah, like you're not getting into trouble, like by, uh, you're, you're, never, like, do, you're never doing what Git does, which is like merging things from Bob in parts of the file he's never seen. Uh, so that's what associativity is about. And also one very cool property uh, is that all patches have a semantic inverse, which means when, you're, when you've written a patch, you can, uh, you can derive another patch from it that uh, has the, like, the opposite effect and then like, push it to other repositories to cancel uh, previous patches. The thing is you can, since you can, it's, it's, all com it's all commutative, so you can basically compute an inverse for a patch you pushed like 1,000 patches ago and it, it all just works. Um, and it, it does even better than just working. It's also pretty fast. Uh, so merging and applying patches is basically the same operation in, in our system. Well, it's possibly the last uh, complicated slide I've written. Like, uh, I'll move on to like, easier stuff after that. So our complexity, for people who know complexity here, our complexity is like linear in size of the patch and logarithmic in size of history, so it's like uh, it doesn't like you can have an arbitrarily big history. It's not. It doesn't really matter. Like you can you can, um, you can apply the new patch your new patch P after an arbitrarily large uh, arbitrarily large number of patches. It doesn't matter. It all it always works uh, the same, like almost. Um, and this is this is actually that was surprising to us, but it's actually better than uh, three way merge, which also adds in a like square factor of the size of the file. And that's actually we also observed that in real world cases where we're trying to benchmark like in early stages of our development we were trying to benchmark it against like a really fast competitors such as git and as file size uh, increase 
we, not, we actually noticed the difference in performance uh, to the point that Pirou was actually uh, faster than Git when merging really large patches on really large pies, which I'm not really sure is a real world case. Um, but anyway, uh, and so that brings me to the last part of this talk. So why, what made Rust a cool tool to work with? What did we like in Rust and how it helped us build this, uh, this cool new system? So one thing is we're working on uh, algorithms on mathematical, mathematical objects, and that means we need types. We need to be able to reason about our code. Uh, and that's very important to us. Like we, we couldn't really, like we want to develop a sound theory of patches and we couldn't like implement it and then rely on like our intuition to build correct C, C code or C or C++ code. That would be like, yeah, maybe the theory is correct, but then what about the implementation? So because we have types in Rust, that makes it easy to, to do so. Um, but we also want to be fast. Like uh, as, as I said, like the complexity uh, theory stuff tells us that we have the, pos we have the potential to be become faster than Git. And we really want to exploit that, that potential and we really want to, uh, to, have, like, to, to be as fast as we can and Rust allows also us to do that. Because we can have like, a, we can use a, like fast backends, we can have like row pointers to uh, like the, the bare metal memory, like M maps and whatnot. So that's really cool. And uh, that wasn't the case in early prototypes that were written in other, in other languages. But also, more, maybe more importantly, so we started doing that because we couldn't convince Windows users to install Darks on their machines. And, and, that's, and, and our goal was to be as inclusive as possible, it was to like, bring version control to everyone. But we cannot really do that if we can only target a small portion of computer users, which are like expert Linux users. Uh, and so what, what we really loved in Rust is that we can write clients and servers for real world protocols. So I had to write some of that myself, but it was actually quite pleasant to write. Uh, but also, yeah, there, there was a, there's already an, an HTTP stack working out pretty well. And I wrote an SSH uh, library, but that was cool. All right, and so we finally got Windows support. And so I'd like to thank the uh, Rust developers for that. That's, that's really awesome. Uh, thanks. Okay, so as part of like, what needed to be written, because Rust is a pretty young language, there aren't that many libraries. So there are, I just wanted to uh, conclude with two really hard things, like two, really, two things that I, I really did, didn't put, didn't think I, I, I would have to write when I, when I started this project. So one is a, is a project that I call Sanakiria, which is a Finnish word for dictionary, because uh, I was in Finland at the time. Uh, well, Sanakiria is a transactional on disk B tree, with like many others, like LMDB, if you know LMDB, like many other database backends. But its particularity is that it has a fork operation uh, that runs in logarithmic time, that is like a fast fork operation. So a fork operation means you can clone the database uh, in like log, log n time, and then have two copies of the database uh, behave as two different databases. So I needed that to implement branches, and it's still a uh, work in progress because it's really hard to do. I'm coming back to it in a minute. Uh, and then there's a, another uh, bacterial agent, uh, just like Rust, uh, fungus like, like Rust. It's called Trash. It's an SSH client and server library that I wrote. It's, uh, it's been made, like it's written entirely in Rust, and it's, been, it's gotten rid of all unsafe blocks two weeks ago thanks to a uh, Brian Smith, who is not here today, I think. Okay, so the trickiest part, the trickiest thing that I had to do in, in with this is, uh, is Sanakiria. So why was it tricky? Well, because Rust always wants to free everything before the program closes. And when you're writing a database backend, that doesn't really sound right. You want like something to remain on disk after uh, the program closes. So that, that was really hard, so you have to do Memor uh, like manual memory management uh, uh, your, like your, yourself. And that's not really, when you're used to uh, functional programming, uh, Haskell, Okema, Rust, uh, like coming back to ma manual memory management isn't really pleasant. Uh, so how does it work? So like, I'm going to explain anyway how Rust helped us do that. So how does it work? It just, I'm not going to be very technical here, but uh, like most database engines are like, s s no, sorry. Some cool database engine that I like uh, are based on B trees. So B trees are basically 
like trees made of blocks. Uh, in each block, there's a, there are like uh, ordered elements. There's an ordered list of elements. There's a constant number of elements. And between these elements, you have pointers to other, other blocks, to children blocks. And it's, uh, so insertion happens at the leaves, and then, well, the blocks split when, they're, when they get too big. Uh, but that's, well, that's how B-trees work. There's a good B-tree library in the standard Rust library. So that was cool, but we cannot really use it to, uh, like it doesn't allocate uh, inside the file, so it, it allocates inside the program's memory. So we had to write a, like a different, like a new library for B-trees that would work in files. And so the main thing I wish I knew when I started uh, writing that as uh, about iterators. So wait, I'm coming back to it. So when, when we're sometimes in B trees, you have to merge blocks uh, when they are when they get too uh, like well, when they get too uh, like under full, you have to merge them. And something I wasn't doing in the beginning uh, because like since you're, since I was doing ma manual memory management, I figured I could like like the C habits came back, and I was like, okay, let's do manual like manual stuff with row pointers and manual things. And that's not really the right solution in Rust because you can use like cool Rust things anyway, even if you have to uh, deal with row pointers. So the main thing I've learned while doing this is iterators and how to use them. So merging pages, like merging uh, blocks like this, can be done the following way. So you, write, you basically write an iter like two iterators, one for each page, they will like give you yield like all elements, all successive elements in the two pages, and you can then chain them and add, add an element in the middle. So that's exactly what you want to do when you're merging pages. And well, deletions in B-trees are usually pretty tricky, and that allows you to uh, get past it really easily. And so the main reason why I, why I, I really liked it uh, is that when you're prototyping, uh, usually your, your head is kind of in a messy state, and you really don't know what you're going to uh, so most of the lines you're writing will be deleted in the end, and you really don't know how to proceed, how, what to do. And so this kind of uh, very concise and, and short, short uh, statements can you know, allow you to, uh, to get past that phase and get like production-ready code much, much faster, because the prototypes start working much, much faster. Um, another thing is that I've learned is that, well, then I was like, oh yeah, so we can have safe abstract, like we can have cool abstractions anyway. So then the Haskell reflexes came back and I'm like, I was like, oh yeah, let's do recursion. Let's put, put in recur recursion everywhere. And one thing I've learned is that it's not always, so in Rust, you can, you can write very concise code, but the recursive way is not necessarily the most concise thing you can do. So in Senakiria, for instance, sometimes we need, so it's on disk, right? So there's a, every time you load something from this, from the disk, it like costs you a lot. So you, you want to avoid like doing uh, avoid doing that at all costs. Like and anytime you can avoid loading a page, uh, it's a map, right? So anytime you can avoid loading a page into the uh, program's memory, you want, really want to avoid it. And and so in order to do that, the, the solution is that we do things lazily. So we're instead of deleting something or adding like adding a new uh, element to the to the B tree, what we're doing is just like we're la doing it lazily. That means we're, we're just saying, well, next time you want to do something, you have to copy, to, uh, you ha you'd have to copy the page and update everything, uh, but just at the time of doing it, not right now, because we, we don't really know what we're going to do with this page. Maybe we'll merge it, maybe we'll uh, drop it. And it would be a huge waste of time uh, to copy it and, and then edit it, or, uh, or copy it and then merge it. That would be, like we would have to copy the page twice instead of just once. So in order to do that, we need to have like write actually something that looks like a recursive function, but we just have to, uh, the, 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 that function which should have access to several uh, consecutive elements in the program's call stack. And that's not really easy when you're writing, a, a like writing it really recursively. So the way it's done in Akira at the moment, it's, there's a fake uh, call stack uh, it's just basically a, an array, and the fact that B trees are well balanced means uh, that it, they are not actually they are not actually going to uh, eat up the whole memory of the computer. So you know that the the, the, the depth is not going to be larger than 64. So you can allocate an array on the stack, and and write like add a full a fake stack pointer. So you're basically s simulating the the program stack. And so that, these are the two main things I wish I knew when I started uh, writing Senakia. 
So I just wanted to thank you, uh, especially the Rust Belt Trust organizers. This conference is awesome. I'm really enjoying it. Uh, and if you have questions, I'm really happy to answer. Thanks.